Thank you for tuning in. You're watching another episode of Advanced Studio Recording Techniques. I'm your host, Matt. On today's episode, we're going to take a quick look at the drum set and how some people go about recording said drums. So in the world of lo-fi music, Mac DeMarco is kind of considered royalty. His work has inspired an entirely new wave of new age recording engineers or just music nerds. They all have like tape machines and old Fostex analog desks, dingy old instruments that you'd buy from the pawn shop and all of them refuse to record into the computer until the very last step. And on the records like Salad Days and Two, yet again we find an artist that's using gear probably less powerful and more affordable than yours. So we often discuss home music production sort of through the lens of contemporary recording techniques and equipment. Basically, digital recording. Everything is through the lens of the computer here. And for good reason, the power stored in that machine is incredibly potent. You have everything you need to make a crazy good record right there. But you don't have to go that route. So Mac shows us how to be an absolute analog legend. Get yourself a tape machine, get your f***ing head out of that Ableton shit, you moron. Come on. So let's hear the story of how Mac got to where he is now and all the equipment and recording techniques he used to record some of his most iconic work. And most importantly, let's recreate some of those techniques ourselves. So how did we get here? Let's rewind just a second. So he grew up with just his mom, Agnes DeMarco. His father was noticeably absent, left when he was only four years old. He would even later write a whole album dedicated to his feelings towards his father. His father's always been distant. In fact, Check out this clip of Mac inviting his dad to a show. His dad doesn't even get out of the car to go see him perform. Come on in, have him come to the group. Oh, no, I gotta go, I'll be back. I just got here, but I'll be back. Oh, that's because my, my old man, my pops. We're not gonna discuss that album because quite frankly, he just got a lot better gear. We'll stick with the lo-fi stuff. So Mac grew up around instruments, but was hesitant to pick one up at first. Eventually he picked up his family's guitar. That became his instrument of choice, but he would eventually pick up much more than that. Now he had been in some projects prior to his solo work, some of which got a decent amount of following for a local band. But for the most part, he had to work some kind of odd jobs, including participating in some medical experiments and road paving and a lot of other rough gigs in order to stay afloat. But for the sake of the topics in this video, let's fast forward to Rock and Roll Nightclub and Two, and then finally Salad Days. We're mainly going to focus the production technique part of this video on Salad Days, but all of these projects were recorded in pocket studio studios in pocket apartments either in Montreal, Canada or Bushwick, Brooklyn. Just like this. This is an apartment in Bushwick, Brooklyn, but don't try and find me, okay? Also, apparently a large portion of these records were recorded in his underwear. I've never done that. I should. His studio was called Jizz Jazz Studios. Am I allowed to say that? I guess we'll find out. Welcome to Jizz Jazz Studios. My name is Mac and welcome to the studios. I'm the head tech of this studio. They call me the Don around these parts. And it's the gear in these studios that I really want to highlight. It's unlike 99% of studios around today and around at the time of the production. Also, shout out to Cy Dudley of the Dudleys. They're an awesome musical group, and if you like Mac DeMarco, you'll love them as well. He's just as big of an audio nerd as me, and when I visited his studio, it looked a lot like Mac DeMarco's studio. And also, you've been hearing his work under this video the whole time. So go check out his Spotify, I will link it down below. He gave me this, and this PDF is absolute gold. If you're a Mac fan, read it, download it, and staple it to your wall. Okay, so let's break down this gear, shall we? Salad Days and Two were pretty much recorded on the following equipment. A bunch of SM57s, a few Beta 58As and 57As, a Roland DR80C. Remember this one, it's an important one. Make a mental note. It's basically an AT2020. And he had an NT2A, but gave it away because he thought it was too harsh and glassy. I can totally agree with that. I see why he did that. Recording and mixing devices. He used a Fostex VF80, a Tascam 244, a Teak tape deck, a Fostex A8, and again, make a mental note of that one, and a Fostex desk, but he never specified the model. Here is a clip where you can see the desk. Uh, so if you know that model, then you know that desk. And for the effects rack, he famously used an Alesis Micro 4. 
He used this for all of his modulation effects, including his famous chorusing that he used for his clean, jangly guitar tone. So what do you notice? Everything is recorded to tape. Everything is outdated now, and everything was outdated when he was using it back then. I mean, his guitar was 30 bucks, man. Now, that's not to say his gear is the most affordable. Tape is always expensive, and a lot of the gear he's used, it's more expensive because he used it. But do you remember that Fostex A8 that I asked you to make a mental note of? Both 2 and Salad Days were all recorded to that machine. And all this equipment had limitations, and these limitations fed into the characteristic tone of Mac DeMarco. So for example, so much of this album has gone through some sort of pitch correction. And I'm not referring to auto-tune here, I'm referring to changing the pitch of the tape, changing the speed of the actual analog tape, and that will change the pitch and the tempo. By recording a part out of tune and then pitching it into tune. Tape will add its signature style, which tape has a sound. It often lacks a lot of high end. It's a lot more warm. So it influences the overall timbre of the tape. And then if you tweak this buddy over here. Kids are always asking me, Mac, what do you, how do you do it? What's the trick? It's all pitch control, you dumb. And because of all this pitchy goodness, you'll often find that Max tracks are often not in like a set key. You especially know this if you've ever tried to play along. It's not typical 440 temperament. If you don't know what that means, he basically records out of tune relative to traditional Western tuning. That's all just a product of him pitching the tape to his desired sort of tone. Here, really quick, I want you to check out this clip from Reverb where they describe the Varus Speed drum recording technique. It's not quite what Mac is doing, but it will give you an idea of what I'm talking about whenever I say Vera speed. These desks that he was using also had their own limitations. They had a limited number of tracks, and that led to a specific style of production, led to a specific style of arrangement. You know, you gotta pick and choose what goes on the record if you only have so many tracks. You might need to sum together tracks and put them all under one single mono or stereo channel. So if you're gonna fit a full drum kit, fully mic'd for example, you might need to sum all of that through maybe one of your other Fostex pieces of equipment, and then route that into one mono or stereo channel in the master board. That means drums can sometimes be kind of narrow and kind of small, but also very intimate. You'll find interesting sort of off-kilter panning choices as well. You definitely have to give some credit to the intimate lo-fi nature of his records to the equipment, not just in the production and the mixing, but also in the composition. So we're gonna recreate the techniques and the tone that Mac got on his drums for Salad Days, specifically the Salad Days song, not the album. So let's go find a drum kit and a drummer and let's do this. Okay, so I am currently sitting on the floor of a small Brooklyn studio that looks way cooler than mine. This is Michael. Uh, Michael is a drummer in Brooklyn and also a freelance producer. If you guys need any drums done at all, hit up Michael. I'll have his link down below. Crazy good drummer, crazy good producer. So if you recall earlier in the video, I said to make a mental note about the DR80C, which in reality, that's, that's kind of just an AT2020. I also don't own an AT2020, but I do own a similar microphone in terms of tone and then also in terms of price. So in order to do this, we'll be using the Neat King B2. It's still got the kind of mellower, mid-forward, darker tone with a bit of a high-end presence to it. I think it's done a lot better than with the AT2020 or the DR80C as well. Now, supposedly, he actually only used one drum mic for the entirety of Salad Days, which is this fat mic technique, which I'm actually going to show you right now. Check this out. So we have the Neat King B a few inches, but not far at all, like maybe five inches above the kick, facing towards the kick around the same height as the snare. Now, supposedly, this tone will lead to a fairly narrow, dark, but also warm tone. It should pick up enough of the snare from this side and leave the overheads as 
fairly quiet and also fairly dark and obviously still picking up enough of the kick. Now, a big technique that he used here was the Verispeed technique, or changing the pitch using tape. If I understand the document that we're basing this off of correctly, we'll have one take that is at the right tempo and is at the right pitch, then we'll record one that is slower and then use a digital emulation, in my case, because I don't have a tape machine, to both pitch and change the tempo to the correct speed and key. We're also going to do that exact same thing sped up and then slow it down using VeriSpeed tape emulation. Now the goal is by using multiple different techniques and then pitching them we're going to add a little bit more width by compositing three different takes together and hopefully by pitching things up we'll add a little bit more brightness that I'm assuming we're going to lose by using this very strange miking technique. It's also worth pointing out that I was going to use his drum tutorial as a reference for this, but my man got way nicer equipment later in life. So I don't think he actually uses this technique anymore. So we're operating on a different plane right now, but it's a plane way more accurate to salad days, especially because we're in a cramped Brooklyn studio apartment slash bedroom. Kind of works. All right, so let's, uh, let's hear the recording. Welcome, it is a, a very different day. So you guys have already heard the drum tones, but let's go over how I produced them and maybe you can use it for yourself. I don't want this to be like a tutorial video though. It's kind of more of a video essay, so I'm, I might kind of breeze through it. So you can see here, we have three different drum takes as explained previously. The 201 BPM is the original BPM of the song. It's played in halftime, so it's more like 100 BPM, but 201 BPM was the click. Then we played 150 BPM faster and slowed it down then played 150 BPM slower and sped it up. So here's the original drum tone, completely untreated. Now let's hear the faster drum tone slowed down. It will be a little bit darker. And then the slower one sped up and that one's gonna be a bit brighter. Now summed all together, still untreated, here's what it sounds like. But now let's add them together, the original, and then I'll add in the other two. Right, okay, so how I did this. Uh, I didn't have access to tape, as I mentioned prior, so I used Ableton's warp function. So I warped them all together, and then I added this tape emulation here by Slate. And then really the rest of it was just deciding on a few panning choices, and then some mild EQing, and then a little bit more heavy work on the group bus out. All of these EQs have a really harsh high pass filter on them because a lot of the woofiness that I was getting from the kick drum because that condenser was so close to it, just didn't like it. Uh, and then they have a high shelf too to add a little bit more breath in. Then on the master, I just have compression, a little bit of parallel compression with the fresh air. And then I have a virtual mixtape doing even more tape emulation. There's a mild room reverb, but max drums are notoriously very dry. So it's really not doing much. So let's hear all three of these takes summed treated versus untreated. Okay, so now some real talk. Do I think this sounds like salad days? No, not really. Uh, do I think it sounds good? Yes. I was actually really surprised by this mic technique, but you know, we probably have a very different kit than he had and we had a different mic. So we did what we could to emulate what he was doing, but I think the soul lives on. It's a very cool tone and I really was not expecting that from this mic technique. Some tips moving forward, if you really wanted to try this, if you have Ableton, you probably need to warp these takes to be way tighter than I did 
read here. You really want these three takes to read more as one take, which means probably a lot more work to the timing needs to be done. These kind of read as three sum takes. It's still a cool tone, but I don't think it reads as cohesively as it needs to be for a finished product. Cool technique I've never seen before. I think anyone in their bedroom with a condenser microphone should try it. Back to the regular video. So what can we learn from this? Same thing as always, quite honestly. Amazing stuff can be born out of very little equipment or definitely off kilter or dated equipment as well. Not only that, but the hardware can be part of the creative process. All those pitching techniques that he used on the tape, the limitations and constraints of old, vintage, cheap Fostex desks, they're part of what makes Mac sound like Mac. Lo-Fi comes in all different shapes and forms. Lo-Fi is a Scarlet 2i2 with an SM57. Lo-Fi can also be recorded onto a four track or a tape machine. It can be analog right up until you need to digitalize it and put it on Spotify. Because we live in a digital dystopia, and if you don't upload what you did to the internet, did it ever really happen at all? Hope that was helpful. I never asked people to do this, but if you enjoyed it, subscribe. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.